Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining HICMA's 2023 Full Year Results q and uh, I'm very happy to have uh, Riyad Mishlawi, HICMA's CEO, on the call today, along with our CFO, Khaled Nabilsi, uh, Bill Larkins, the head of our injectables business, Mazen Darwaza, the head of our branded business, and Brian Hoffman, uh, who heads up our generics business. Uh, Mazen Darwaza is on the phone, um, and the rest of us rest of us should be on your screen. Uh, we are going to um, have Riyadh give uh, some introductory comments, and then we will open up for Q&A. So I'll hand over now uh, to Riyadh. Thanks, Riyadh. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, everyone, for joining us to discuss the 2023 results. Before we get to the q and I, I would like to give you a few high-level thoughts on our 2023 performance and go a little bit on the 2024 outlook. Let me start by saying I'm extremely pleased with our performance in 2023. We have delivered strong growth in both revenue and core operating profits and core profitability. All three of our business contributed to our growth this year. Let me start with the injectables. Injectables continues to deliver. The revenue was up 6% in 2023 with an impressive and consistent core operating margin to close to 37%, probably one of the highest in the market. We've been busy expanding our portfolio by launching new products and expanding our manufacturing capacity, which is really allowing us to build our presence in the new market, in new markets, and enhancing our existing market position in both the EU and MENA. It's worth noting that our 503B compounding business is progressing well. Month on month and year on year, we see growth as we build our customer base and portfolio. But we did, we did decide to relocate it to our other segment this year, which will help us ensure clear focus on its development and investment going forward. The branded division, on the other hand, had a standout performance in 2023, particularly given the headwinds faced from Sudan and the difficulties with the Egyptian currency. This division continued to prove to be resilient. Despite all that, we have continued to build momentum. And I'm excited to report that we are now the second largest pharmaceutical company in MENA region by sales. We continue to focus on high value products used to treat chronic illnesses, which really was a great contributor to bringing our margin above 23% this year. And finally, the generics division, coming from a very tough year in 2022, had an exceptionally strong 2023 year, both in terms of revenue and profitability growth. Our base business saw an easing of the significant price erosion that this business is used to, that especially experienced in 2022, and we have been winning new business across our differentiated portfolio. We also benefited from the launch of our authorized genetic of sodium oxybate, which we launched at the start of the year. In addition, we continue to invest in building our specialty business and saw a good momentum for Plaxado, our eight milligram naloxone nasal spray. Finally, to move on to the outlook of 2024, we're confident that 2024 will be another year of progress. And we're guiding to four to 6% group revenue growth and 660 million dollars to 700 million dollars group core EBIT. This introduction of a simplified group guidance is new for this year. As a CEO, I'll focus more than ever on collaborations between the three businesses, sharing best practices and leveraging our commercial strengths, R&D capabilities, engineering expertise, and everything that we can, we can really uh, collaborate on for the benefit of the group overall. As a leadership team, we are focused on group performance. And by adding this to our guidance, we're highlighting the strengths of HICMA as a group rather than some of its three parts. So with that, let's get started with Q&A. If you would like to submit a written question and are watching via Spark Live, please use the Ask a Question button. Alternatively, if you're participating in verbal questions, please use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask a question. Once you've been invited to ask your question, please turn your camera on, unmute and ask your question. Our first question comes from Peter Vilgot at City. Please unmute your line and ask your question. Thanks, um, Peter Vilgot here, City. Um, thanks for doing the call. Just, just two quick questions. Um, we had firstly on um, the compounding business. Um, you know, in terms of making it, it's, it's a big driver of future growth, um, a lot of investment going in, but. Can you just help us understand 
how we should be thinking about that business this year. I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking 25 to 30 million of revenues, similar loss. Um, and am I right in thinking that this will be the peak investment year? So can I push you? I know that longer term, you've talked about 300. You're not going to get there next year. But can you just give us a sense when you know, what you're doing with that compounding business this year, what the priorities are, um, when we might see break even? So that's question number one. And then secondly, for Bill, I think this is the first time I've, I've got to get to interact with you um, and the wider audience on the on the on the Zoom. So just love to hear when you're, you're taking over from the from the you know from the CEO now. Um, it's been the jewel of the crown for for Hickman for a number of years. So what are you busying yourself with? What are your you know, top priorities in terms of uh, you know, running the strategy and driving the business going forward at Injectables? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, let me start with the compounding business. Um, in the, in the last two years, we have been really focusing on the operational and the regulatory side of this business. So a lot of equipment had to be installed. We really invested a lot in automation for that business. We put water systems in the business. We, we created uh, a lot of uh, uh, very, very similar. We took our core business and we really did a pilot, a smaller size of it. So we mimicked exactly what we do, which allowed us to really uh, assure a lot of the quality, uh, potential quality problems. We, 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 we created clean rooms uh, um, and, and we created, uh, and we invested a lot into the, the automation and, uh, of, of filling. Um, that was really done. Uh, everything that we had to automate with it. The last one was our water system, which was installed a couple of months ago. So that's online. Now what we wanted to concentrate on is the commercial part of it. So we have a big plans to do that. We had hired new people. Uh, we have a new strategy of how to go about it. And we are very optimistic that this is going to, uh, um, you know, really uh, uh, do well in the future. Let me just point out one thing that is important for this business. It's very important to start and build this business slowly because it is, um, it is a business that um, requires some manual. Uh, you, you need a lot of employees. You need a lot of labor. You need to do it right. You need you can you, you need to build your portfolio slowly. You can't just come in with a lot of products. You you have to little by little build it up. We are doing exactly that, and we are very uh, we, we've been growing month on month, year on year, um, and I think uh, the future is going to be big for this for this uh, for this business. Our next question is from James Gordon at JP Morgan. Please come to the line I, I, and ask your question. I think, Bill, you have a, a part to that question. That's yeah, I, I did. I had part two. So uh, thanks, Peter. So you know, uh, pretty much it's much the same as, as what Riyadh was doing. I think the, the twist that I bring to the business is I'm a scientist by academic training, and most of the early part of my career, I was in R&D. So the only thing probably fundamentally different from, uh, from Riyadh in the past is really looking uh, globally at our, at our portfolio and pipeline, uh, enhancing it by adding more complex products into our internal development programs, enhancing uh, the expertise internal to our already, already great R&D teams, and then also making sure that we're collaborating outside with uh, the best business partners on, on opportunities and products that we choose to not do in-house ourselves. Our next question is from James Gordon at JP Morgan. Please unmute your line and ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Lovely, great. Sorry about that. I had some audio issues earlier on. Uh, yeah, it, uh, so apologies if this was missed while I had audio issues. It, it was two questions, please. So one was about the generics outlook. Um, so, so you said that generics is going to guy is, is going to grow three to five percent. But if I look at what Chaz have already uh, um, effectively guided, what they think is going to happen with generic Xyrum and the royalties they receive, it looks like that would be driving all of the generics growth that you're going to have this year. So is that right that the guidance for this year for generics doesn't include any significant uh, new launch contribution? And, and as a follow up to that question, what does the guidance assume for calling? Could that be a product that would make a significant contribution this year? Because you have publicly stated that you, uh, you had a settlement on that product with an accelerator clause. And I believe Teva's now launched, so that would seem to be something that would trigger your accelerator clause. So, so just where are we on that? Is that upside to the guidance if it happens, or have you actually baked something in for that? And then uh, the, the other question was also around uh, top line outlook. So just for injectables, so the six to 8%, uh, which is a strong growth outlook, 
and it's still a little bit slower than the high single digit growth that you talked about at the injectables event two years ago. So are there any particular headwinds that you'd call out for injectables or, or is it actually possible that you would do a bit better than that if, if no headwinds pop up? Brian, why don't you take the first question and uh, you know Bill and I will take the second one. We'll collaborate on the second one. Uh, sounds good. Um, uh, th thanks for the questions, uh, James. Uh, yeah, for, for, first off, um, you know, we're, in terms of our guidance for 2024, we, we are expecting three to five percent growth. Um, you know, sodium oxybate, we expect still to be a significant contributor in terms of revenue, albeit that uh, based on our settlement agreement, the, the margins will be lower um, in, in 2024 than it was in 2023. In, in, ter in terms of uh, Corlum or generic mif mifeprestone, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, we, we don't have product specific guidance for, for that product. We do have a settlement agreement that's public for October 1st, uh, 2034, but we do have accelerators. Um, all I can say for that product is that um, our guidance reflects all of our revenues that we expect for this year. Um, um, and so I can't comment on that product specifically, um, as we haven't commented on a specific launch date. Uh, James, I, I will try to answer your second part of the question about the injectables, and then maybe I'll give it to Bill also to comment on that one. Uh, I just wanted to say that we have everything uh, in the injectables that is that has potential to grow. So as far as capacity, as you know, we had added lines um, middle to end of last year that I think will contribute greatly for the 2024 goals. We are building facilities that also will be online sometime also in 2024 in both North Africa and also we're expanding Italy. Um, and we have some interesting products that we're introducing. To add to this one, we had added 17, launched 17 products last year. It was a record of 17 products that had been launched last year. And as you know, that those products will start contributing more and more as time goes. So once you launch the product, you have to wait until you have the opportunity for a new tender to come or open up before you participate in it. So all of that, I think, will contribute to the growth of 2024. So we're very confident that the, 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 uh, the growth will be good and will be healthy. Whether we are going to break it or not, I think it will depends on how the new products are going to be and how, uh, how are we going to... Uh, but I think we are in the right direction. The growth is, is uh, we are confident with the growth um, and, and, and let's hope that we break all the records. Bill, you wanna to add to, to, to this? Yeah, maybe just a, a couple of things just to add on to that, Riyadh. So in addition to just the US, so just globally, and again, the same concept that Riyadh's talking about, about growth into 2024 with these products, we launched over a hundred products globally in 2023. So we're gonna to start to see the benefits of those in 2024. We have a robust pipeline. We have quite a quite a number of products pending approval at FDA that we're expecting to get a number of those approvals in 24, and we'll we'll launch in 24 and beyond. And so, uh, I, I would say the, the the feedback from my perspective is we think the six to eight uh, percent revenue growth is uh, is is achievable for us. I just want to add to Brian comment on the generic business, James. So in addition to what Brian just mentioned as well, the other base business continue to grow. So specialty business is growing. CMO business, we are focusing on that and it's growing. Adver as well, generic Adver is, is, is growing. So it's not just the growth in the sodium oxabate. Sodium oxabate will continue, as Brian said, is a, a, a significant contributor to, to the revenues. But at the same time, the base business is delivering as well and growing. Thank you. Our next question is from Alistair Campbell at RBC. Please unmute your line and ask your question. Ah, great, thanks very much. Um, I just got a couple of questions. Uh, one's following on from, from Pete, just on the compounding business. Um, I'm sort of chancing my arm a bit, but just obviously now we're gonna to have to think more carefully about what that business can look like over the next you know, three to five years. Um, if you are successful with it and it sort of grows the way you anticipate, can you give us a sense of what the margin structure of that business might look like? Should I be thinking something more akin to the generics division or more akin to the injectables division? And then as a follow-on just on injectables, 
Um, obviously, um, compounding was a part of the growth story there. So having moved that outside of the injectables division, are you still comfortable you've got the levers in place in injectables that it remains a high single digit growth business in the medium term? Thanks. All right, I'll take the first part and maybe Bill, you can comment on the second part. So as, as far as the compounding, the, the, the FDA estimates the compounding business is between two to $3 billion. A lot of that compounding business today is being performed by hospitals themselves. So there is a lot of credibility that you have to build in order for you to get that business because it's very important for hospitals to continue getting the product in a quality way. So as you know, some of the compounders, a lot of the compounder companies have gotten in trouble by the FDA. And that really uh, troubles hospitals. They want a product that they can rely on. They want deliveries that they can rely on. They want quality that they, they, they want to rely on. So we are coming in and saying, look, we can offer you all of those three. And it's important for us to deliver. It's important for us to build this business slowly. It's important for us to build the quality and the very strong base to this business. We still believe that we are very, we have the advantage of creating such a business because we're backward integrated. We know those products, we make them in the core business and we are we sell a lot of them, millions of those vials that we sell in the market. And, 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 and thankfully we do have a very good quality uh, uh, systems and, and, and quality control and good quality records. So we believe we're the right candidates. But at the same time, we don't want to jump into this business in a very uh, uh, um, uh, irresponsible way. We have to build it step by step. Where would it get to? I think it can get to a very uh, high number. It really depending on, um, at this point, it depending on how much we want to grow it uh, and how fast can we grow it. I think we, we think that the, the potential is there. We now are working on building credibilities. We're now working with the hospitals to, to believe that we are the right partner for them. Uh, but as soon as we do this, uh, it's going to be uh, for us, um, you know, another step in what, what do we do with this business? Should we expand more? Should we build more of those units? Uh, but we, we still believe in it. And we still think that we will have um, a very potential, potentially a very significant funding business. So then on the second part of that uh, question, so taking the compounding out of the base injectables business, I think it does two things. One that Riyadh was talking about with the, the necessary investments and focus on that business. But I think it also allows, uh, allows us to show year over year growth and just the base injectables business as well. So it's kind of a, a twofold benefit there. As far as the, the sustained uh, growth, I think we feel comfortable with the achievability of that six to 8%. Um, going forward, we have robust pipeline globally. We have quite a number of products that are that are sitting with regulators today, pending approvals, and a robust launch plan for 2024 and beyond. So, you know, we we feel very comfortable with that uh, that growth range going forward. Let me let me just add a, 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 a small. Uh, you know, you did ask about the margins, and uh, let me just add a couple of sentences about that. So, so the margins depends on your volume. You know, the more volume you have in your facility, the more mar the better the margins are. But uh, if you if you if you think of this business, we are backward integrated. So we make the products that we're starting up in compound. We are forward integrated. We have the sales team that in our core business that we can use to promote this business and 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 uh, have the customer service that needed that is needed to support this business. So we are in the best position of any of our competitors to be to have and deliver better margins. Thank you. Our next question is from Emily Field at Barclays. Please unmute your line and ask your question. Hi, um, thanks for taking my questions. I'll just ask two on injectables. Um, one, um, you know, I, I believe this is kind of the first time that you guys have talked about shortages in Europe. Um, I know that you're sort of building out injectables in Europe as well, but I was just wondering if you could maybe go into just a little bit more detail on, on characterizing the shortage is in Europe and sort of how they differ um, from the U.S. Is this something that you expect to continue to benefit from in the years ahead? And then just, you know, on injectables um, segment margin, um, you know, not an X compounding is kind of what I'm asking about. Um, you know, you're guiding for a very similar margin in 24 that you had in 23. Um, do you expect to get any operating leverage from the two new high-speed production lines that you have ongoing? Or maybe if you could just give any color on sort of why perhaps 
we wouldn't expect to see a little bit of margin expansion this year, potentially. Thank you. All right, I'll take the first part and Billy take the second part. <laughs> it seems like it's going in that. Uh... So for Europe, um, yes, we have been seeing shortages in Europe more than ever. Uh, and it is uh, really contributed to some of the companies that have gotten in trouble in Europe. Uh, and when you get in trouble, of course, and you are a big producer and supplier of medicine in Europe, that creates a lot of shortages. So we've seen it. Uh, the problem, well, the thing that, that we historically were concentrated on um, putting all our uh, capabilities, our, our capacities to support the U.S. market. In the last few years, we expanded a lot in capacities. And I think we are a little bit now have... Uh, you know, enough capacity to support also, as we said in uh, my introduction, we have now capacity to support other markets and, and Europe uh, and, and, and MENA is, uh, is, as you see, they've been growing and a lot of uh, products have been uh, being approved there. Uh, we've seen we've seen now uh, a lot of companies coming to us to supply um, the, as we get to know, but uh, to, to get to be known more, uh, you know, we, we, we are now uh, uh, present in France, which we weren't in the last two years. We're present in Spain, we're present in the UK. So we're seeing more and more demand to products that we have that we sell in the US. In fact, just a couple of days ago, I got an, an email from a company in the UK asking for a product that we they get from the US because of shortages, it's made in Portugal. They want to see how can we make it a shorter supply chain and go straight to them. And so we see that a lot. And, and, and we had benefited that from supplying not only from a financial point of view, but also from patient point of view. We had done a lot in France and a lot in Germany actually last year to, that, to, 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 to really respond to some of the need for, for shortage products. So we're seeing it more than ever. Uh, and we're trying as much as we can to. Bill? Yeah, so the, the question on the margin expansion with the lines in Cherry Hill and Portugal, it's really a, about product mix. So as you know, these with these new lines, it's, it's for existing commercial products and ex existing commercial batch sizes. So it's more about uh, filling the demand with the same product mix. So we're not expecting to see any margin expansion uh, at this point with those new lines. Maybe just adding to what uh, Bill mentioned, uh, NOA is still a margin of around 36 to 37 percent is one of the highest in the, uh, in, 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 in the industry. And as Bill mentioned, it all depends on product mix. Sometimes you have CMO opportunities. Um, the more we grow in MENA and Europe, uh, their margins will uh, contract slightly because we are growing in these countries, in these regions, and these regions have a lower margin than the US. So. Uh, we have as well to absorb it's a inflation it's a global issue you have to ab absorb it and we are managing that so with all of that we are maintaining our margin at 36 to 37 percent which is one of the highest and we've always said in the past that the, the, in the medium term we'll go maybe to the mid mid 30s margin in the medium term so but this is still a very strong margin Our next question is from Thibault Butherin at Morgan Stanley. Please unmute your line and ask your question. Thank you. Um, so I just have three questions. The first one on the brand dead. Um, so you delivered on the portfolio mix improvement that you have been talking about for some time. Um, and this was a, you know, a driver of the margin improvement in 23. Just wondering how much room do you think you have to continue to improve that product mix or is it already in a good place and, and how to do better? Um, second on Cloxado, you mentioned it as a driver uh, in terms of specialty contribution. Uh, we, are we are seeing a competitor launching uh, another differentiated product on the opioid overdose segment um, with you know, Obvi and Almefen from Indivior. Just, just wanted to know if you see anything on, on the market because I think they're targeting the same channel as you. Um, so if you're seeing anything here and, and um, how you think about the impact on growth. And then last, Quick question, the update as usual on US generic pricing, if you can just uh, give us an indication of what you're seeing, is it still kind of low single to mid single uh, deflation or, or is, it, is it normalizing towards something a bit higher? Thank you. Brian, you wanna take a stab at this? Sure, ha ha happy to start. Um, so good Cluxado, we saw some really go good momentum in 2023 and, and we expect that to continue in 2024. Um, 
you know, we think it's a it's a unique product, um, and that um, we're, we see that uh, seventy eight percent of overdoses require um, more than one um, uh, more than one four milligram nasal spray to revive patients. So that's kind of the value proposition that we have with our eight milligram, uh, and it's been very well received in the market. Uh, we're more focused on uh, working with uh, working in the government channel than the retail channel. Um, so it it takes some time to uh, build your brand and 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 that channel. Um, so we did see some very good progress in 2023 and expect that continue in 2024. Um, in terms of uh, generic pricing, we did see um, an ease in price erosion in 2023 versus 2022. I think we saw low double digits in 2022, and we saw you know mid mid to high single digits for the industry overall in in 2023. So we're expecting that that rate of price erosion to continue into 2024. I think Mazin was trying to unmute to uh, answer the branded question. Are you there, Mazin? Hello. Uh, hi. Hi, okay, Sorry. Technology. Uh, for the branded uh, business, basically, as you know, we have invested uh, greatly in the MENA markets. And we are still seeing growth in these MENA markets. But we are facing some headwinds, especially on the issue of the currency. And this is one of the things that we are facing and trying to sustain our margins. So for next year, we will have single, mid to single high growth in the MENA market. And our profitability will also increase in constant currency. But on a reported basis, we will be flat as we have been this year. Was there another part of the question, please? Hello. Um, I think uh, I think you're in mute. Okay, I think we can move on, I guess. Uh, sorry, no, no, that was it. Thank you very much. Oh. Okay. Our next question is from Max Herman at Stiefel. Please unmute your line and ask your question. Great, thanks for taking my uh, uh, questions. Um, it actually, really, just looking, given given the you kind of answered the uh, branded margin expansion or reasons for lack of this year. Um, the question on uh, um, the injectables and biosimilars and where you are, uh, what your kind of attitude is to biosimilars in the US now. I think. Uh, next year was kind of the year from which you'd start to potentially see launches. So just looking ahead, how are you seeing that develop and, and what are your thoughts on that? And then maybe just on, again, on the injectables, what are you doing with uh, um, Combogesic in terms of Salesforce? Because you obviously haven't had an injectable promoted product in the past. So just interested in that, how you're going about the launch of that. All right, maybe Mazin, you can continue with the with the branded, and then uh, um, Bill and I maybe we can put some a couple of comments on the injectables. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, as as you also see that uh, this year our branded business had standout performance in twenty twenty three, but as unfortunately we had to halt operations in Sudan and face we still have headwind currencies in Egypt. Uh, but we were still able to deliver rev good revenue growth at a very strong operating margin. We are still supported and building momentum by supporting our portfolio. And I'm very excited to report that now we are the second largest company in the MENA region by sales. So if you look at all of these, we have a strong base in the MENA. We continue to invest in the R&D, bring higher value medicines, and especially we're going into chronic disease medicines. And this is paying off and driving the growth that we see today. Supporting our growing portfolio, uh, we have extensive local manufacturing footprints, as you know, in the MENA. We have more than 23 manufacturing sites. And this is one of our greatest assets. And this differentiates us 
from our competitors because in every country we're a local manufacturer and this this gives us uh, more flexibility in the market and meeting the demands and the shortages in these markets. We will continuously invest in expanding and enhancing our manufacturing experience and our strengthening our portfolio as a local supplier with global expertise using the synergies of the group, as Riyadh has explained, from the three businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Mazin. Let me just say a couple of words about the biosimilars and I'll hand it over to Bill to just you know continue with that and talk about Combogesic. So for the biosimilars, as you all know, we have a deal with two partners to, to bring in two biosimilars to the market. And um, as you all know, the biosimilar market is, uh, everybody's watching it right now. I think that's um, something that some people had uh, doubled in on it and some people had stayed away from it. It's a little, a little unpredictable in a way of, of how it's going to pan out to be. But in my opinion, it all depends on which ranking do you come in at? You know, are you the first, second, third to the market or are you seven, eight, nine, ten to the market? So that depends. Uh, that's going to really depend on how you go to design your strategy, your commercial strategy to the market. And uh, we don't know exactly where we, we have an idea, but we don't know exactly where we're going to land. But if the more that the, the more precise information that we have, that, that you know where we are going to be ranked, I think it will be more um, good good uh, information for us to 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 help us design how we are going to approach the market. One thing good about uh, our partnership is we have it. Our partners are good, and and their cost structure is very. Uh, a, a very good and very competitive. So if we had to go in and compete based on only the commercial side, based on, on pricing and then cost and all that, I think we still can do that. But I think we really need to see where we're going to land and how uh, uh, this is going to, to, to end up uh, you know, with the biosimilar market and then we'll design a strategy of how we are going to market our own. Um, you want to, Bill, you want to take the Combogesic? Uh, question oh you want to ask the biosimilar if you, you, please feel free well, well i just think on the biosimilar just to, just to add on to that real quickly like for our our particular two products we're not expecting uh launching these products until sometime in the at least the latter half of 2025 just to be clear it's not a it's not a 2024 uh launch of either of these products and then on combo Gizic on the sales strategy, uh, the, the the quick easy answer is it's a it's a combination. So we have intern some internal resources. We just hired a a brand manager for uh, before the launch for for combo Gizic. and then we also are using a contracted outside sales team to support the support the uh, detailing of that product. And and is that product sort of uh, sort of a leader into how? Uh, you see the branded, uh, sorry, the biosimilar uh, products then sort of following into that same infrastructure that you're building around Combogesic? Uh, no, two different, two different infrastructures. So what we're doing in Combogesic isn't translatable to what we're doing, what we'd be doing with our biosimilar strategy. So those go-to-market plans are distinctly different. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Victoria Lambert at Berenberg. Please unmute your line and ask your question. Sorry, some um, uh, mute uh, uh, difficulties going on there. Um, uh, my first question is just on um, the injectable uh, IQVIA data that came out in December, it looks like Fresenius SE, well, Carby did well, um, taking some share from Pfizer. Just wondering um, how December was for, for you guys. Um, are you also taking share from Pfizer? Um, and if so, what do you think is going sort of wrong at Pfizer? Um, and then are you seeing any uh, geopolitical uh, impact uh, on the branded division um, from what's going on there at the moment. Um, and then could you just confirm uh, that you have all your licenses in the US now for sterile drug compounding? Thank you. Oh, I guess it's uh, also for me and you, Bill. I, I'll, I'll do just a couple of things. Uh, as far, I'll start with the last one. As far as, as far as for the licenses, 
The only major license that we have left is for California. I think the other one was New York, and we got that a couple of months ago. So I think as far as licenses, we're pretty set for from the compounding point of view. It's uh, it's the other things that we talked about earlier that we have we're building right now. Um, as far as the injectables, um, Bill, do you want to take this? Uh, you want to take this part? It, it, so what, what specifically was that around? Uh, for Xenius, is that around the question? volumes in December? M maybe uh, I could say a couple of yeah, things. So it's had a great so December. Let me just, yeah, so sorry, ahead. I was going to say the same thing. So we had a very strong, we had a very strong December. I, you know, I haven't, I haven't looked at the data relative to taking share from, from Pfizer or for Xenius, but we had a very strong December. Uh, I think there was a question about the geopolitical risk and. Uh, as you know, the MENA is 18 different markets, and our largest markets are Saudi Arabia, Algeria, and uh, North Africa. Jordan is a, a major market also for us, but we do not do any business in Gaza, so we have no sales in that part. The only thing I would say it's uh, costing us a little bit more on the logistics side because due to the issue in the Red Sea, for shipment, but this is insignificant compared to uh, the, the uh, volume of the business. So no, we do not have any impact uh, from the war that's going on concerning the business that we have in the Middle East. Great, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Peter Vilgalt at City. Please unmute your line and ask your question. Yeah, thanks. Just two two follow ups, please. Um, just Bill on just your level of involvement involvement or not on this compounding business. Does it still come under your remit, or is there a completely um, separate management team? And then Khalid and and, and Riyad, um, or maybe you, Bill, as well. But um, if you execute and get um, uh, and get the compounding business to where you want to be, you know, three hundred million at peak, good margins. Would the idea be that that would then come back into injectables or we should we always think that from now on you're going to separate the businesses? And then just to, for Marzan, um, just a couple on on, uh, on Mina. Is there any way back in Sudan or is, is, is that just, you know, have you written that off basically? Um, and could you maybe just delve a bit more into the key markets in anything of interest going on in Saudi, in Algeria or Egypt, apart from FX? That you want to comment are they on your key markets thank you so i'll take the first part of the question uh, riyad and Halid, and i'll leave it to you on uh, the financials of whether it's in or out or when it comes back so <clears throat> from a compounding business perspective it is it is under uh, still under my uh, my organizational structure i think as riyad touched on at the beginning there's a tremendous amount of synergies with our base business so it makes sense from a from a management perspective to have it linked to the base business. Uh, again, from a sales perspective, we use similar types of product selection for the for the products for that business. Uh, the competitive intelligence we find from uh, detailing our base products into that business. Uh, we also, as as Riyadh also mentioned, uh, many of the products that are that are utilizing compounding, we are actually the the producer of the vials that go into those compounded products as well. So staying connected uh, with our base business on all of that is immensely helpful. And is the idea to bring it back to inject, to, yeah, is, it, the is the idea to bring it back into injectables? Yeah. Right. Sorry, right. Right. Sure, I will, I, will, I, will, I will answer and maybe Khaled can continue with that. Uh, I think uh, for me, just to add to what Bill is saying, you know, this business doesn't only provide us a good opportunity for growth, but also intelligence. We know now what doctors want. We know what formulation they rather have. We, we know how uh, they want the product to be uh, the delivery system of the product. And not only it helps us in creating the compounding portfolio, but also helps us in our core business. So it does make sense for this business to continue to be in the injectables. Um, I, I believe that it probably would be, uh, depending on what happens, and how we run it today, we're running it very much um, uh, together, you know, under Bill. Um, and if if it continues to produce more and grow, uh, there's no reason why we 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 not we don't continue managing it that way. Whether it is in the financials to be added to the injectables or not, 
Khaled, what's your what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think it's as as we said, this is like a, a startup business for us, and so it requires some investments at the beginning, and it's diluted on the injectable business, and this is where you have more clarity on the performance of the injectable and the performance of the of the compounding business. Now, once it becomes fully integrated into the injectable business, and there's a rationale that we bring it back to the injectable down the road. Still early to judge at the moment, but it could be. Khali, can, I, can I be a bit cheeky? Can I just be a bit sorry, sorry, Mazan? Just can I be a bit cheeky? Um, when you come back to your long term outlook for injectables guidance on margins, it's like mid 30s. Would getting, you know, would the compounding business be dilutive a longer term, even if it hits those growth targets or no, no, what sort of margins? No, no, we are not talking. We are talking now separately. We haven't considered that we are including or uh, excluding it. I'm saying if it's going to be fully integrated into the business going forward, which we still don't have visibility, how it's going to be managed. And as, as Riyadh and Bill mentioned, it's managed by, by Bill under Bill. Now, going forward, if we see that there's a lot of rationale integration, and then, then we might consider, and of course, we'll be uh, upfront to the market on this. So far, there are no plans. It's the plans is to get it separated into others, and, uh, and then you will be able to see the performance of the compounding business going forward. And of course, we'll, give, we'll start giving you guidance on this. But Peter, as 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 you want to to I think to ask is is would this have the same margins as our uh, general business today? You know, we can't really say exactly what, but I can tell you that you. Probably if you look at our competitors, we have the ability to do much better. We are we have a lot of synergies for this business. We have it backwards and, and, and forward. We make the products that they buy from others and from including us. Uh, we have our same sales force that we use for our core business. So our synergies are great. So I would believe our cost structure will be even greater and the volume is very important. But I believe if we get all that things done, these things done and execute well, uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't have very healthy margins. Coming back to the, the MENA, Sudan, as you know, still is in a war situation and it's very fluid. Our assets have been impaired. Uh, the manufacturing sites have been vandalized. So we are out of manufacturing in Sudan. And most of our team uh, also has been transferred to other markets in the region. Uh, we will try to continue serving Sudan by other uh, means, like now with some countries start, started buying donations for Sudan. So we're, we're having a very small business, but nothing as before. And we do not plan to go back. If we plan, once the war is over, it will take at least one to two years to go back into manufacturing process because of the destruction that has happened. And we have impaired the, the whole Sudan loss as a market. The other markets, as you know, Peter, this year we're number one in Saudi Arabia, and this is a mild, uh, great achievement. So if you look at all of the multinationals and the local, Hikma being the number one company, this is quite an achievement. So we're expanding our presence in Saudi Arabia, and as we have stated, and Riyadh has stated, that we're now on a, a long-term project of new capex in Saudi Arabia for new manufacturing sites. So Saudi Arabia we stay a major market for us. That market is growing and we have a very good market share. And we continue to invest also in our technology, our new portfolio and our pipeline in these markets. The other major market is Algeria. And also like Riyad said, we have started in a new plant of injectables there. We're upgrading our oncology plant in Algeria. We are investing in new lines. Uh, in Algeria, and now we are also number three or four in the Algerian market in terms of market size. Morocco also is a growing market for us. And of course, Jordan will stay one of our uh, markets as we have been demonstrating during the last couple of years. So in a nutshell, we will continue seeing double uh, growth in constant currency in the MENA, but we really don't know what's going to happen to the currency in Algeria, uh, sorry, in uh, Egypt. And this is why we are guiding towards uh, um, into single growth in in uh, in uh, the reported, but uh, the mina is growing uh, on a constant currency in double digits as we have demonstrated uh, during the last couple of years. 
Our next question is from James Gordon at JP Morgan. Please unmute your line and ask your question. Hello, thanks for taking the follow-up question and, and hopefully you can hear me. Uh, yeah, my, my question was on capital allocation. So just how to read the very significant uh, in increase in the dividend today. So it's quite a big jump in the dividend. Does this mean you're now not very likely to do a buyback anytime soon? And, and more so, does it mean that significant m a is now not very likely in 2024 uh, and beyond but you, you'll have a bit less cash for buybacks but also you, you wouldn't delever as quickly if you did do a big deal and is, is, is this also saying you're now a more mature business it, it won't require as much investment and there's also maybe just le less out there to buy and that's why you're returning more cash so how to think about that please i'm going to give uh, the, the the bulk of this question to khaled and khaled can explain that but i, I want to take the m a part uh, no, I think m and is, is really something that we're looking at, uh, seriously looking at. I think uh, our growth and our aspiration to grow even more than what, we're, what we want uh, it kind of just happen organically. We are going to focus on inorganic growth. We're looking at uh, uh, interesting assets out there and more and more are, are coming up. So no, I, I don't think uh, the, the intention there is not to do any m and On the contrary, we are very active in BD and m and how did you want to take the second part? Yeah, so um, given that uh, the board confidence and the long-term uh, growth prospects for the business, uh, we decided that we'll increase and change our dividend policy, as, as we mentioned, from 20 to 30% payout to 30 to 40%. So in a way, we are going to progressively uh, increase our dividends, where we increase the growth of uh, dividends, either in line with the growth in, 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 in uh, net income or uh, higher than that. So it's going to be either stable or we are going to grow to grow and to be capped at 40%. And we still have enough headroom and firepower today to do, to do that. And at the same time, we have the firepower to do acquisition. As Riyadh mentioned, we have over 1.6 billion available today to do acquisition. Is the share buyback on the table? We do that. We consider this from time to time. Once we see the opportunities available in the market, if we have it, we have uh, to invest in the market. Of course, uh, our preference is always to invest in growing our business. But at the same time, from time to time, the board might consider to do a share buyback. But so far, not on the table today. Uh, and this is why, just to give the confidence in, in the performance of the group, we are increasing the dividends. So this is a good message. It's not going to have an impact or implication on our uh, policy going forward in terms of m a or in terms of any opportunity that we, we would uh, see. Thank you. This concludes the Q&A. I will now hand over to Riyad Mishlawi for closing remarks. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining the call. We're really pleased, as I said earlier, with our 2023 performance and very excited for our outlook on 2024. We look forward to keeping you updated on our progress. Thank you very much.